So this is uh, Kick and Kickers. Um, we are going to talk about how to write good endings for your stories. And um, I am Emily Conover. I am a board member of Dexwa. And um, so thanks everybody for joining us. Um, just FYI, this panel is being recorded. Um, and uh, also uh, be sure to abide by the code of conduct. Um, and uh, yeah, so I am a reporter at Science News and um, I decided I wanted to organize this panel because I have like this bad habit of when I get to the end of a story, um, you know, writing like a 2000 word story, getting to the end and being like, oh, now what do I do? <laughs> so I'm trying to break myself of that habit, trying to get some new strategies for how to uh, get around that. So um, we have, uh, a few skilled writers with us to talk about that. Um, we have uh, Sarah Kaplan from the Washington Post, uh, Michael Grushko from National Geographic, and Tina Fey from Science News. And they all have written lovely endings, and so they're going to share some of their wisdom with us. Um, and we're gonna start by going through some example kickers that they've each written. They're gonna tell you a little bit about, you know, their process for these. And, uh, you know, then we can go into kind of a Q and A. Um, there should be a, you should see a Q and A box that you can put your questions in. And uh, we'll just have a little discussion um, about writing uh, kickers. So, no further ado, here's our first uh, kicker from Sarah Kaplan. Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about this one? Yeah, sure. Hey. sure. Um, so this story is from earlier this spring. Um, I, like probably many of you, um, became a virus reporter uh, sometime around mid-March. Um, and I had been trying to find, um, I'd been assigned to write a story about um, what the, you know, how the virus affects the body. And so I was talking to this um, thoracic surgeon from GW Hospital um, who could talk about, you know, the way it affects the lungs. And he had actually done um, a kind of three, very um, rare 3D scan of the lungs. Um, of an infected patient and had released it, um, had gotten the permission of the patient's family to release mm -hmm. that image publicly so that other physicians and the public could see it and really understand um, the kind of destruction that this virus, the coronavirus causes. Um, so in the midst of that interview and he's showing me the lungs and um, I asked, you know, what happened to the patient? And he said that the patient had passed away. Um, and he, since he said he had been in touch with the patient's family, um, I asked if, if I wrote a note to the family saying that I'd like to talk to them and, and tell their loved one's story, um, would he send it, pass it along to them? And he did. And so um, turns out the patient was a man named Keith Redding. Um, who is from Maryland, and his wife Dana called me a couple of days later. Um, and I think one of the things, as soon as I started talking to Dana, who is just an incredibly um, loving person um, and speaks really emotionally and eloquently, um, I could tell that this story that had started out being about what the virus does to the body. Um, was also now going to be about what the virus does to people and to families and to relationships. Um, and I thought it would be, you know, to have the two of those things in one story would be really powerful because you would be the pain that was going on inside alongside the pain that was being felt outside um, of Keith's body um, in the people who love him. Um, so anyway, so I wound up writing this story about um, about Keith and his wife Dana um, and the doctors who treated Keith. Um, and the reason I wanted to share the story of the kicker with you 
was that I suck at kickers and I hate writing them. And I feel like I often will do the thing where you just like throw in a nice quote at the end so you don't have to actually write a kicker yourself. Um, but this was actually the rare case. And something, a piece of advice that um, people have given me is that especially when you're writing a longer story, a feature or a narrative, you need to know your ending before you start. Like you need to know, if you think about the, the story is a train and the plot is an engine, you want to know where you're going. Um, otherwise, the train might, you know, like your, your engine probably isn't going to work that well. Sorry, that's a bad metaphor. Um, or I, I've messed up the metaphor. <laughs> um, but anyway, they, so this was the kind of thing where, so usually I struggle with that, but this story, when Dana told me about the last moments of Keith's life, um, I knew that that was really, really powerful. Um, and for a little while, I actually thought about having it be the lead of the story, because sometimes you want to put your best stuff up top because that way you know people will read it and they don't some, you know sometimes people give up before they get to the end of a piece but i also felt like it's you know this scene of dana having her hand on her husband's lungs and um feeling them go still and kind of having that acceptance of, of what had happened um, because she initially, the story starts where Keith's doctors have come to Dana and say they don't think he's going to recover and they want to start a discussion about when to take him off of life support. Um, and so the sort of like, you know, one of the tensions in the story as you're reading is like, how is it going to end? And, and I felt like once once I identified this ending um, of this moment where Keith's life ends and, and Dana has this feeling of, of um, acceptance of it, then I knew how to, how to frame the rest of the story, basically how to get there. Um, because it sets up really well, both like the, the physical, anguish but also the emotional anguish and um i think it's such a beautiful like that image of, of dana with her hands on her husband's chest um was such a beautiful image and it, it's the one that stayed with me and has stayed with me ever since you told me about it and i wanted it to be the one that stayed with readers um so that's kind of like how i chose this ending um and yeah, and I think, and I really do think it helped. Like, I never take that advice to like, know where my story is going right to an ending. But in this case, knowing that I was gonna end here made it like so much, so much easier to, to write the rest of the story. Cause I knew what the chronology needed to be. And like what the, you know, if you think of the story as like the traditional narrative arc with like the rising action, the climax and the falling action like this is the falling action and the climax is when um, it becomes clear that Keith is not going to survive, then, um, you know, it just, it, it be, you start to be able to put the pieces in the right place. Um, and, you know, again, I have a friend who often talks about a story as an engine and you want to like, um, when you, when you have one piece in there, it's easier to know where the rest of them are going to go. So. Um, yeah, that is, you know, one example of a kicker that I'm, one of my favorite kickers, just in terms of like, um, it, it was both a really beautiful moment, and I feel really grateful to have gotten to share this story. Um, but also, I think that um, in terms of just like, knowing that I had the right scene to end on. Um, I was glad to have this one. Yeah. Great. Well, um, yeah, I, I think this is really, um, really impactful too. And maybe we can talk about this some more, but I think, you know, a lot of great kickers, you know, are so, you know, they give you an emotion, they leave you with an emotion. Um, and this one in particular, because it ends with his lungs going still and then you know, and then, and then the story's over, it feels very still, you know, you're, you're like sitting there reading and all of a sudden 
goes still and your mind goes still because the words are gone. And I, I liked that um, sort of parallel. Um, so, uh, great. Should we go on to the next one? Let me see. Okay. So, Michael. Yeah, so um, I just want to you know, add one thing to Sarah's beautiful yeah, yeah. picker and her beautiful story. If you haven't read it, please read it. It's wonderful. Sarah shows great control of language here too throughout the, the kicker with the restraint, short sentences, really letting that final moment you know, set in. I think the control of tone throughout that whole section, getting us to his lungs are still, does so much to really make that last line pop. So kudos to Sarah. Um, it's beautifully written. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is a piece where um, I had, this, this piece stands out to me because um, this was one of these really snarly, big, like I'm getting calls up until like the evening before we run sort of narratives. The backstory here is um, the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC did um, these chemical analyses on um, its 16 purported Dead Sea Scroll fragments. Um, they, they hired these outside um, conservators and scientists to do this battery of tests. And it turns out that all 16 were modern forgeries, um, inked recently on scraps of archeological leather. Um, and this proved to be a very twisty turn story um, that I was reporting up until the deadline for it. Um, and it was difficult to know, like, I wish I had had the clarity that Sarah had with her story as to how exactly I was going to land this plane. Because it was, I was, you know, trying to build the plane as I was flying it uh, to really abuse this, this transportation metaphor. <laughs> um, and then I interviewed um, this, Christopher Rolston, who's this specialist on um, Semitic text, texts at, at, at GW. And, you know, as we were talking, and as by that point, I had done enough reporting to start of, not to lead sources by any means, but to kind of have a sense of like the themes and what a lot of people were saying. And so as I was talking to Rolston, I asked him sort of, you know, what does this mean? And then he just dropped what I think is one of my favorite great quote kickers that I've done in recent years, because it immediately in just like two sentences, he cuts like straight to the theme of not just the story as it's progressing, right? The museum of the Bible trying to make good after years of questionable practices in the way that it assembled its collection, not just collecting forged materials, but items of dubious provenance that were stolen or looted. Um, but that it sort of, it, it's connected to the, the, the Bible itself, right? In this case, we're talking about that we spend the story talking about 16 forged fragments of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and so in, I don't know, I think in this case, it, the, the snappy quote kicker works pretty well. Um, <laughs> and it, it really was a nice, as I was sort of writing it and sort of, as soon as he said that, I was like, wait a second, this is really good. I feel like this is a good, this is a good kicker you know, quote to, to sort of end on. And kind of like in, in Sarah's instance, once I had a, had that nugget that I knew already was emblematic of the themes that kept coming up in my reporting and with the drafting of the story. As soon as I had that, then it was like, okay, well, how can we build backwards and make sure that we smoothly get readers to, um, to this point. So um, yeah, this was a, this was a, a rollicking uh, good time to report and um, 
hopefully it was a fraction of that to read. I don't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think this is another, I mean, this is a good example of like, of time, time together themes, like as he says, right? The theme of the Bible and the theme of the story. I think that's, you know, there's sort of like, um, you, you know, a few different boxes you can check in kind of what you do in your kickers. And I think, you know, making thematic connections is a great, is a great one, so. Okay, does anybody else have anything to say about Michael Henry <laughs> before I go on? Yeah, I was just gonna say, that I, I think that that is a, a rare gift that you get sometimes from your sources is that mm -hmm. perfect kicker quote, um, but it doesn't always happen and it's really beautiful when it does. Yeah, no, it, it as soon as he said it, I was like, I, I don't think I've had this feeling in a long time where as soon as he said it, I was like, I'm going to take that. And I'm just going to like put that in a little, little treasure chest and that's going to be my kicker. Um, so, but I, you know, I think in terms of, you know, now that I, you know, I had that, you know, it's something that I'm going to be thinking about for longer term things. Like sometimes just straight up asking people like, about like the way things are, are are resonating more broadly, right? Like, I mean, people people find pattern and theme in their lived experience all the time, and it's a perfectly natural thing to ask about. I think you you don't want to be you know trite with it or you know create some you know an artifice of it, but I think asking the question like, hey, how does this connect? What's what do you think the broader takeaway is here. That's, I think, a, a totally reasonable question to have in your arsenal as a reporter. And it might not lead to, you know, nice usable quotes, whether, you know, something that you could have up top to guide people in or a kicker to really punctuate things and flare out, but maybe. Yeah, I think that especially with science stories, there are often, um, you know, often the science can be like a metaphor or a or an allegory or yeah, like has some kind of resonance that the scientists who have been doing the work are probably have been thinking about, right? They've probably noticed, or maybe they know it. They don't even like they know it intuitively without ever having ex expressed it explicitly before, and I think. Um, probing at that a little bit, like trying to get, asking researchers like, well, what do you think this means? Kind of, you know, just in terms of like humanity <laughs> um, or even telling them how you're feeling sometimes. I'll just say like, you know, oh, that makes, you know, that's really inspiring or like that makes, reminds me of something and then that'll get them going. Um, yeah, I, I, I recently had a, I recently wrote a story that that I very much had this conversation with the source. So um, it was a study that came out a couple weeks ago now. What is time? <laughs> I forget what time is. Um, but it was this, it's this armored dinosaur uh, fossil found in Alberta. It's very well preserved. And a study came out that was like, we have its last meal. And not only do we have its last meal, based on that, we know roughly what time of year it died. We can tell you more specifics about sort of this environment, like it was eating in an area that had been recently impacted by wildfires. And I just had this moment talking to the researchers, which is like, wait, hold on. So we, it, 110 million years ago, unfathomably long ago, we have this window of time, hours, where we know that this animal was eating in this particular kind of environment. It's nibbling on ferns and a, you know, a in a field that had been, you know, racked by wildfire, you know, weeks to months beforehand. And just sort of reveling in that for a second, right? To Sarah's point, researchers are either thinking about these things or they've been so focused in getting the details right that like taking a second and going, well, wow, what do we have here? This is like a remarkable thing, this remarkable vignette that that this study allows us to to recreate like i don't know it creates it creates these these opportunities for people to think about 
theme and the bigger meaning that they might not give themselves day to day. So what Sarah said. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the next one. So this is from Tina. So Tina has two that she's gonna share with us and this is from a shorter story. Right, so um, this one actually might be one of my most memorable kickers. Um, it's from a story about how penguins, um, the, these, these genes that are involved in tasting all sorts of things, all of the tastes, um, have been lost in these penguins. Um, and as I was talking to uh, one of my sources for this story, he mentioned that fish have these taste receptors on the outside of their body. And, and he said, you know, it's kind of wild because we don't really know. They might be able to actually taste the penguin. <laughs> and I was just blown away by that. Um, and so I use that as, as my kicker. And uh, everybody who's ever told me that they liked this story have all specifically cited this kicker about <laughs> that although the penguins can't taste, the fish may be able to taste the penguin as they're being swallowed. But this is a somewhat controversial uh, kicker because when so this is the version that went on our website, but uh, when it was being cut to go in the magazine, um, there wasn't enough room and the editor, I think rightly pointed out that this bit is not about the penguins uh, <laughs> losing their sense of taste. And it is speculative because we don't actually know if the fish can taste the penguins. So it, it, it got cut for the magazine. Um, but I just thought it was like too good not to use. And um, I like to give people a little surprise at the end, I guess. Um, and, and there was never a question that I wasn't gonna use it. It, it was too good not to you. <laughs> it was just whether or not it would be kept for the, for the magazine version. <laughs> if only we had another inch. <laughs> yeah, I really love the way that this kind of, it, it sort of takes what you've, the, what you've been doing the, throughout the story and then just totally flips it on its head. Um, that kind of like reversal or that sort of, um, I don't know, we spent so much time talking about penguins and then we have this very um, vivid reminder of the way that the, that, that penguin is interacting with the, the world around it. I, I, yeah, I think it works really well. I love the idea of like giving your readers a little surprise or a gift at the end. It's like, um, yeah. You know, like the the marshmallow that you get for reading all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> for reading this far. <laughs> oh, it's such a it is such a good gift though. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell that to like everyone I know. <laughs> Poor fish. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, and Tina's second one is from a longer story, so right. It, lead, it has both the lead and the kicker here. Yeah, because it's, it's a little bit important. And, and, and this is uh, sort of what Sarah was talking about. This is what I call echoing, um, where you start off with something in the lead. In this case, it was this uh, microbiologist who you know, we were talking about personalized diets. Um, and she says that her mom is always asking her, you know, what should she eat. And I had originally written all of this in the lead that 
you know, she had this conversation with her mom and she, she just tells her mom, she doesn't know what she should, what she should eat and then went into the story. Uh, but then as we were editing it, it, it became um, kind of obvious that it'd be nice to, to start off with that question and end with the answer, which is still a little bit of a question, um, that would also sort of give the idea that this is an ongoing field of research that we, you know, although you hear all the time, this is what you should eat and this is what you shouldn't eat, we, we don't actually know and it might be different for every person. Um, so, and that's a, that's a technique. I mean, in this case, it, it does end on a quote, um, but it doesn't have to. Right. And I've, I've used that uh, several times um, in, in stories, especially in longer stories, to kind of, to pull it back around to the beginning. Uh, and ideally, that person is not, or that situation is not just appearing at the beginning and end of the story, but would would um, be a thread that goes throughout the the mm -hmm. entire story. Um, so, yeah. So, echoing the lead is is a really good way to to end. And if you're stuck, if there's a way that you can do that, that that might provide you with a with a good ending. Um, well, uh, let's see. So I think um, we can start kind of heading towards Q&A. So if the attendees have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in that Q&A box. Um, and I guess I'll just say, I mean, so I think this is really nice because, you know, I just asked you all to share a kicker. And I think you all kind of hit on like different ways of doing it, like different, you know, there's the sort of emotional ending, there's like the theme, you know, sort of like reinforcing the theme or making a new connection with the theme. And there's the surprise ending and there's like the, you know, the echoing ending. Um, do you have, are there other strategies that you, <laughs> that are like your go-tos that you think we haven't discussed? What, or, or, or what else are your, um, like what other goals do you have for, I think there's also like trying to trying to look forward into um, what's going to happen next, and give some little some little preview maybe of what's coming up. Uh, you know, to say, oh, and there's some big study that's about to come out, or something like that, or you know, or these paleontologists think they may they may be on to an even bigger dinosaur or something. Yeah, yeah, I think about, so I'm, Tina, I'm so glad that you, you brought up echoing as a structure, because I think about, this is sort of my default when I'm thinking about, particularly for news stories. Um, I want to try to come up with a really evocative, catchy scene as my lead, as much as I can. And if I am setting a scene, can I find a way to come back to it and build on it, um, either in a forward-looking way or some other sort of facet of that scene that maybe wasn't explicit at the beginning? Um, in fact, I'm writing a feature right now that I'm playing with this, where I open um, at a you know particular spot. And then we go on this whole narrative thematically and chronologically, we end up back where we started. And I think, you know, good writing, you know, has the twists and turns, but is smooth and secure like a roller coaster. And I think there is value in some, you know, all the time. You obviously every piece of writing is its own, its own creation, but, and when you, you know, it's like when you're waiting in line and you see the per people come um, who just did the roller coaster and they come back and their hair is standing up and they're like, whoa, <laughs> there's value in that. 
<laughs> if you can evoke that in in text, where particularly if you're the person who's just come back and you're like, oh, I remember 90 seconds ago when I was here <laughs> and I'm changed for the better. <laughs> Like, I think there's value in yeah. that. If you can accomplish that in your writing, um, I mean, we'll see how it goes in the future I'm writing out. But, <laughs> uh, but I, think there's, I think there's real strength in, in, because the reader remembers the lead, hopefully. Oh. Um, and, you know, they recognize what you're doing. And, you know, I think can, you know, see the change in themselves as they've circled back themselves, so. Something also that, um, so my editor is a big fan of the writer John Franklin, who is a newspaper writer from, who in the 80s, he was awarded the first Pulitzer for feature writing. And he has this whole, um, like, concept for how to tell a narrative story in which every narrative has to have a complication and resolution. And so basically, like, your story you want the lead to set up some kind of complication, some tension, either internal or external, that the main character and story is facing that they're gonna be struggling with over the course of the narrative. And then the, the last, the final moment before the kicker is, here's what they do and how, and then the kicker sort of how it gets resolved. Um, and so sometimes that is helpful for me too, to just like, if I take a step back from a story and I think, okay, what's the complication? And then what's the resolution? And do I have both of those things? And then that also helps me decide like, how do I write this story? Do I write it as a narrative or more kind of explainery or something? Um, but also it helps me identify kind of where, um, yeah, like how to tell it um, and to tell it like you don't, you know, for a news story, you kind of give away the resolution in the lead, right? Because you have to tell people what happened in the lead. But I think mm -hmm. that for a feature, and especially for a feature where you're being asked to go on a journey with the character, you don't want to give away the ending. <laughs> so, um, you know, saving the ending for the ending is kind of, it's different from how we learn to write for news. Um, but I think mm -hmm. that's um, a good thing to think about as you're going into those kinds of stories. Um, great, let's go to some questions. Um, okay, so here's one. So uh, what are some things that you should always avoid in endings or do you have any rules that you never break? <laughs> rules are made to be broken. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should, you should avoid cliches, but in this case, I don't really know what the cliched ending would be unless it's the end or something, but um, I don't think any editor would let that get through. <laughs> well, I think for th this question is going to, the answer to this question is, is, is going to depend on whether it's news or, or a feature. Um, I think one of the thing, the, a rule I set for myself when I'm writing news stories is uh, like echoing uh, what, what Tina said earlier is, you know, I want them to leave with an understanding that you often when I'm covering a study, it is a study. It's sort of this incremental thing in a much longer sort of chain of inquiry. So the, the, the idea that, you know, this study itself is not an end, but a beginning. So if I can, give readers a sense of that like kind of okay we've done that we have the this in, this research in hand we have these findings in hand now what i find that to be a very effective way to end news stories even just to inform the kinds of questions i ask because researchers themselves are you know cognizant of this and are usually quite excited about it so that can often be a nice way to report your way into a good kicker. Okay. Um, oh. oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say something I generally try not to do, and I don't think it's a hard and fast rule because Michael did it in his kicker and it was very effective, but I try not to introduce new characters. Makes sense. Okay. Um, 
Great. Okay. So what, what kinds of questions do you ask to elicit the kinds of punchy quotes that make for good kicker or lead material? I feel like researchers often tend to answer questions in an overly detailed way that isn't always quotable. Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, it, it's kind of rare that you get the perfect kicker quote. Um, but you do the same sorts of things that you might do for eliciting quotes for elsewhere in the story where you, you know, you tell them, um, you know, what is this like? Like, how would you explain this to your mailman or your 10 year old, um, you know, who doesn't know anything about science or what's really cool about this um you know get them talking in um uh, in metaphors and analogies about their work and sometimes that will will give you something more evocative than the than the standard jargon yeah i think that um you know, often I try to get my interviews, especially um, especially with scientists, I try to get my interviews away from the kind of like question answer format as soon as possible and turn it into a conversation. Um, and so like a lot of the time, you know, maybe you ask your first few questions um, and it's more of a, you know, you wanna get the basics of the research and, and you know, be conversational in, um, what the study is about or what the person's work is on. Um, but then, you know, I try to bring a little bit of myself to the conversation and then hopefully the, the person I'm speaking to will bring a little bit of themselves. So like if the study reminds you of something that you did in chem lab in high school or like if, you know, anything that um, you can become a little bit more human and not just a robot asking questions, then they will become a little more human and not just a robot delivering answers. And that is often where you get things that are more funny or evocative or, um, you know, the, the kinds of things that, that help make a story come alive. And, you know, I, I'm trying to think of an example, but um, uh, some, you know, sometimes I'll ask like, do you ever feel, um, like bad for your study subjects or like, you know, especially there's like, um, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember talking with a scientist about how they felt bad. For, oh, it was for the um, neutrino detection at the South Pole like two years ago. Um, and this, this massive observatory has been down there for like a decade and it finally caught one neutrino and I was like man that must you know like that observatory is like 10 years and all it gets is like one teeny 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 little subatomic particle and we talked about sort of like you know like how what a Sisyphean task that is um and and what the level you know and then that got into a conversation about like what's the level of satisfaction when you make this detection and then what does it mean when it's just one detection and you really want to be making many detections um and yeah, I mean, asking, do you ever feel bad for your instrument that has to sit down there in the cold and wait and wait and wait and it never gets anything? Um, you know, maybe it's a silly thing to ask, but I have found that like my greatest reporting tool is just like not being afraid to look stupid, so. <laughs> I like that tip, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I think with, th with this kind of, particularly when you're interviewing scientists, establishing a rapport with them as quick as possible. Um, I'll even, if I, <laughs> this is kind of a fun, uh, this is a, a, a sort of a silly thing, but if I'm coming uh, in and I've done some reading and I just wanna make sure that I get like the basic outlines of something, I'll even just frame it as like a game show. Well, I'll just tell my, my source like, okay, we're about to play a game and the game is how wrong is Michael? And, <laughs> And it usually, they, they almost always break. They almost always start laughing and they're like, okay, I'll play. And then, you know, I'll have just a couple quick questions and they'll say, you know, whether 
you know, how, how accurate my understanding is, but I, I use it as an icebreaker specifically because it's silly. It kind of, it's a weird question. Not a lot of people ask it. <laughs> so, you know, by, and I usually ask it with enough gusto, they're like, okay, fine, I'll play ball. And so we quickly get to a place of rapport where exactly as Sarah said, okay, we've, we've broken the glass on silly. We can go there. So now let's go there and let's ask the question, like, do you ever feel bad for the instrument? Or like, <laughs> gosh, like, you know, this dinosaur, like, kind of had a sucky last few hours, didn't it? <laughs> and you can, we, can, we can go there and it's safe because we've established that rapport. Um, so I think that's huge for, for getting the kinds of zinger or evocative quotes and sort of thematic strands that make for good kickers and good leads for that matter. I like Michael's suggestion also because it shows you've done your homework, right? If you come to the conversation and you can be like, I read your paper and I'm going to ask you some questions that like maybe show my, that I don't have a PhD in this thing, but like I did read the paper, then the scientists will trust you more or, you know, appreciate you. Um, Cause you know, sometimes they go in assuming the journalists don't do their homework and there are some journalists who don't. So I think that, that's also, that's like another good thing, a way of building rapport and trust is just showing that you, um, you're putting the work in to understand and to come to the conversation with sufficient background knowledge that you're gonna be able to ask interesting questions and, and tell the story right. Okay, we have another question here. Um, do you have a particular place for the quote, just stop talking style of kicker writing where you simply say your bit and then don't attempt to tie it off? This is a strategy I go with when I'm really struggling and don't hate the result. Well, that's pretty <laughs> much the strategy I go with for most stories. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say it's my favorite strategy, but uh, yeah, sometimes it comes to that, especially when you're on a very tight deadline. Right. <laughs> yeah, I I try to avoid the just say your bit thing. I think when when things get you know dicey for me, I default to um, coming up with a sentence that you know flings us back to the lead, or even just sort of flicks at that opening image. Something that again sort of provides that that um, that sense of journey. Like, e even if it does, if it's not a quote or anything like that, but it's, you know, you know, and now we know more about insert evocative scene here that you, you know, maybe flipped out at the beginning. I, yeah, I, that's sort of my version of the say your bit. Yeah, I think there's actually, like there's a place for the just stop talking kicker. Um, and I am, I actually um, have ne had never been very comfortable with the just stop talking kicker and I'm trying to become more comfortable with it because I feel like sometimes, like, you know, especially for a straight news story um, where you're on deadline and you don't have time to be messing around trying to think of the greater meaning. And sometimes you're not, it's not really your job to be creating greater meaning for a particular story anyway. So I think that like, you know, you can just be like, all right, here, guys, you've been informed. Like, go forth. Um, and I, th I feel like that sentence should be, like, that should be, like, the contractual ending for that yeah. kind of story. <laughs> Sally forth, my informed <laughs> minions. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I do tend, like, if I find myself in that sort of situation, then I do try to tend to go for the what's next. Yeah. Here. Um, to try to bring it forward so it doesn't feel like it just ended and maybe they missed the part where it said where the story was supposed to continue on page A17 or something. Um, okay. I don't think we have any more Q&As from the audience, but people, well, you should keep putting them in if you've got more questions. Um, I will ask, um, so what do you, you have a strategy for, say that you've done the reporting for your big feature, 
and you know you've had lots of good conversations but you don't have something that was like boom this must be the ending right do you have a strategy for how you deal with that um how do you pick out the piece of the story that should be the ending i mean for me it kind of goes back to that like thinking of the story as an engine metaphor um and I think, you know, one thing that I've been trying to do, especially like in the past few years, as I become um, like you, we all sort of, you know, once you master kind of like the inverted pyramid, you feel good doing news stories, you can write on deadline, trying to think about like honing craft. I spend a lot of time reading other people, the stories, the writing of other journalists I admire and taking apart the engine, so to speak, and, and then figuring out how did all the parts fit together. And I think that doing that then helps me identify when I'm reporting, oh, there's a part here that kind of is like the part in um, this other story. And like, how did that writer build their story? Like, maybe I can build my story that way. And actually the story about Keith Redding is I mentioned John Franklin, one of the stories that I was thinking about as I was writing Keith's story was this piece that John Franklin had written about um, a, a surgeon attempting to remove um, a woman's brain tumor. And it's like a narrative and it's, I'm not gonna give it away because it's really good. Um, you guys should go read it. But some of the ideas there um, and like the themes in the story and kind of the way that he, Franklin chose to structure it. Um, I read, you know, I, I was thinking about it as I was reporting and then I went back and reread John Franklin's story and that helped me kind of decide where I wanted to, how I wanted to arrange the pieces of my story. Yeah. Um, I, the way I, I think about it, if I'm struggling with an ending is, you know, one approach is kind of like what, um, what Tina did with her um, with her nutrition piece, which is think about if, is there anything that's jumping out as a place to start, and and if you know once if you can identify a place to start the story either with a particular person or there's a particular scene that makes a lot of informational and thematic sense to be the beginning, like if this is where we start then chronologically even, like what's the end? Or if we sort of take the echoing approach where we maybe end and like an end at the beginning with a twist, like is there a way to take that opening and break it? Is there a place to cut it in half and take the second half and put it, you know, at the end? Um, yeah, that's sort of, I, I, when I'm thinking and I'm struggling with like, God, golly, how do I, how do I end this? Look, look for the beginning and then go from there. Or it doesn't even necessarily need to be the beginning. It could be something in the middle. Absolutely. But, but for then, sure. Um, you can come back to and bring it around. So it's not, it's not an O, it's more like a, an E or something. Yeah. Literally, I've been, I've been drawing modified E's. <laughs> okay, uh, we have another question for Sarah, um, which I actually want to hear the answer to. Um, the question is about your story, Ghosts of the Future, about the Burgess Shale. Yeah. Um, and uh, they just want to know if you want to say anything about the ending because it's one of their favorites in recent oh, memory. I have well, to say I read this story too and actually I think this was probably the reason that I asked you to be on this panel because I thought it was a very nice ending. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember how I ended that. So I'm just going to go look at it real fast. Oh, um, wait. Sarah, are you asking me to dramatically read your ending? What? No, no thank you. Because um, okay. I just, will. Because <laughs> um, I also think let me just pull it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're putting okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um. Yeah. So I had I went to the Burgess Shale last summer, um, 
and just on vacation because I'm that kind of nerd. And um, it was incredible. We had like the two most amazing guides. These women were like so thoughtful and um, just like had so much interesting insight into both the history of this site, which contained fossils of, um, you know, some of the earliest animals in Earth's history, um, some of the earliest kind of big complex multicellular life. Um, but also in, they thought, you know, we talked a lot about one of the guides is a um, environmental studies teacher in the Alberta public school system. And so we were, we talked a lot about climate change and, um, and the, you know, the responsibility to preserve sites like the Burgess Shale. They actually have very strict restrictions on who can go up there and they're even like trap cameras to make sure people don't steal the fossils. And so when I came back down, all of that stuff was in my mind. And this interesting story about like the emergence of animal life, the predecessors of everything that ever walked, swam, or crawled on earth um, was mixed up with like thoughts about humans and our impact on the planet and what responsibility we carry. Um, and then I waited six months. <laughs> to start writing. Um, but that was sort of, you know, the point of this, or what I wanted to say with this Burgess Shale essay was to sort of reflect on what does this capacity to know our history, to, to read the rock record and know how things can change and what stays the same, what rules of life and evolution are constant, um, and how the circumstances of the past are coming for us too. Um, so anyway, so I wrote it and then I submitted it to our Outlook section um, and they were like, you don't say what you think <laughs> or like, you don't say what you think should be done. Um, and you know, I'm not used to doing that because I'm a, not a, a opinion writer, um, but they sort of, they encouraged me to, um, amp up the ending with more, you know, in this whole last section that sort of focuses on um, climate change and our role in it um, and the pace of um, extinctions and um, what we need to do to stop it. Um, that, that was actually my editor from the opinion section who, or from the outlook section, who kind of got me to say like, you've just, told people this like very thought provoking idea and they take taken them us on this journey from you know uh a billion or half a billion years ago till now now where do you want them to go from here and so that's kind of what that last section was i wanted to leave people thinking about okay you've got from the um you know the cambrian to the present now now what um and to me, like the, the message of, of this, of the British shale and of geologic history is that like, we know, um, we know what we're doing and we know what needs to be done, right? The, um, unlike any other creature that ever went extinct, we actually have the capacity to change our fates. And um, that is both, I always think that that's both a responsibility and a gift. Um, so, and that actually, that what a responsibility, what a beautiful gift um, is something that I thought, like I thought that phrase on the hike, um, that was like the thing that I kept thinking the whole time that we were up in the mountains. Um, so that's, uh, I felt like it's, it's a thing I want other people thinking too. It's a beautiful story, Sarah. And the thing I, I really love about that line, what a profound responsibility, what a beautiful gift, is the way you use it as a leitmotif throughout the whole piece. Yeah. Um, and I think through repetition and these slight little tweaks, like that is a profound responsibility. It's just little tweaks, but the message again and again, and you, you lead us there in, in several different ways, right? Particularly at the end where it's a more forward looking um, version of what we had earlier. Um, 
you knocked it out of the park, Sarah. <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> so nice of you. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's as a person who loves rocks, um, who is now a climate reporter, this essay was like the perfect marriage of my the two things that I feel like I spend most of my time thinking about, which is like how awesome and interesting is the universe and like all of the stuff that's so much bigger and longer and older than us. And then also like, wow, we're, we're like really getting ourselves into a hairy situation. And um, like, we need to like stop and look at what we're doing <laughs> and do things differently. So um, yeah, it was, it took me a really long, it took me a really long time to write. Um, I, there were many, many stops and starts, many, um, the lead changed like a million times. Um, yeah, I think I spent like four months noodling with it before I let anybody else look at it. So um, I, mean, I, I was doing other work at the same that time. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I'll just mention that there is now a link to the story that we've been discussing in the chat. So um, anybody who hasn't seen it can um, take a look. Um, Great. Okay. Uh, what what else do we got? We maybe have time for one or two more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah. So another question: Does the wind up or the ramp up to the kicker affect how you shape it? Hmm. Like you mean what what comes right? before it, I suppose. Um, yeah, definitely it can. Um, I mean, if you're doing kind of a surprise ending, then no. <laughs> that comes right out of left field. <laughs> but uh, for most things, yeah, you, you really do, as with the rest of your story, you really need to build from some place to a logical conclusion. Um, and so you, you do have to shape both the kicker and the, the preceding several paragraphs. And I mean, I, I would argue that, you know, it's not necessarily the last sentence or the last paragraph that is your kicker. It's that whole, you know, last section of the story that that is really the kicker um, because all of that is what your reader is going to be left with. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Tina. So I'm, I alluded to a feature uh, I'm writing now earlier in the conversation um, where I'm playing with sort of ending where I begin. And originally I had, um, so this is a, this is a, a feature kind of, it's the print sort of expanded version of the of a story I, uh, that we published, uh, mm, what is time, um, just over a month ago from a reporting trip I took to Spain, uh, to Morocco. Um, so it's this big kind of survey piece that incorporates some of that reporting. And I originally began and ended the story in Morocco um, for, um, to, to highlight kind of two different themes that sort of emerged in that reporting trip and then through the rest of the story. Um, yeah, my, my editor and I have gone back and forth on that structure. The piece is no longer beginning and ending in Morocco. Um, and as a result, yeah, I had to substantially reorganize um, the piece because exactly to Tina's point, the 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 ramp up to the ending it has to get deliver you to a place that makes logical sense and is also like emotionally satisfying mm -hmm. um and you can't get there unless you have like a nice smooth thing again to abuse my roller coaster analogy from earlier like we've all been on not great roller coasters <laughs> roller coasters have been our thing we've all been on things where it's like Am I going to fall out? Am I going to vomit? Is this safe? Like, you don't want to give that experience to your reader. Nausea is an emotion, but not one you want people leaving with. 
Yeah, and, and you know, and as Sarah's train metaphor, you know, there's a reason that the caboose always comes at the end, right? You don't want to stick it in the middle somewhere. Um, so you you really do have to think about uh, what is the overall structure and what what makes sense there. Yeah. I think the the um, kind of I'm like thinking now about Michael and I were talking about or I was ta talking mentioned my trip I went to the Arctic last spring mm -hmm. um, to do a story about uh, people training for the year-long mosaic expedition which is currently it's this icebreaker that basically locked itself into the um, sea ice and they're drifting over the North Pole over the course of a year. Um, so they're up there now. But um, at the time they were at this training site in Alaska and um, I got to go out with them. And that story, I was really, that was really hard to write the kicker because nothing had happened yet, right? Like I spent all this time training with people, but like the entire story was kind of anticip in anticipation of this journey that they hadn't actually embarked upon. Um, and I wound up like writing. So like I wrote kind of, there was a scene with the two main researchers that I was writing about this um, older scientist who had been on a previous um, transpol or not a transpolar drift, but on a previous drift expedition. And then his younger kind of protege, who's this, who, um, you know, never knew the Arctic that he once knew because she's mm -hmm. too young. Um, and, and then I was like, okay, well, I have to write about like what comes next. And so then I had this whole section on the importance of the polar ice cap and how it relates to weather at mid latitudes and this emerging field of research and what kind of information they're looking for from the mosaic expedition. And like, it was kind of, it was a different story. And my editor, when she, she pointed that out to me and she was like, you want to like, you, you want to like um, satisfy some of the sense of anticipation, but like you can't because that's not the story you're writing. And so I wound up leaving, ending it much earlier with that scene that I thought um, I, was, I couldn't end it on because it wasn't conclusive in any way. And the last quote is, is something about along the lines of like, we don't know yet, or no, we can imagine to, um, Melinda, the younger researcher, says, like, I can't imagine the Arctic without any ice. And um, and then her, her um, the older researcher, who's kind of her mentor, says, I can imagine it. What we can't imagine is what the ramifications will, will be. And so you sort of leave with the sense of unease and um, things have not being resolved. But that's also, that's the situation, right? Like that's the situation in the Arctic. So um, I'm not sure what I, why, why I thought of that or brought that up, <laughs> except to say that like sometimes your ending is actually earlier than you think it is. Um, I think that, and I have read, yeah, I, I like can, can think of stories that I've written where um, I accidentally wrote the ending and then but, and then kept writing. And I think that sometimes. <laughs> a, a Lord of the Rings kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> but I think what's, what's, what's effective about that, right, is that that is, that's like a really thematically resonant place. Yeah. For, for that kind of story to end. What I also really like about that ending in terms of the technique is often we're interviewing people in isolation, like I'm in a phone call with researcher A and then researcher B. Dynamics totally change once yeah. it's three or more people talking. I right? can't recommend it enough. It's so good. It's so yeah. good. I mean, Actually, that's why, that's why like the most effective fiction narratives, right? Operate around trios because of the different alliances and conflicts and personality differences, right? You think about any really amazing work of literature, I, there's probably like a fundamental trio at the, the core of it. Yeah. And so if you can get two or more people in a conversation, right? It's gonna be so much livelier than if it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, an interview is the quotes that you get out of that are exposition, right? They're not dialogue. And when you have two people talking to each other, two people who, not you and the other, and the interviewee, but two of your sources talking to each other, then you get dialogue and then you can create a scene. And it's just like so much more evocative and um, it really helps you put readers there. And like the, um, you guys should all listen to the Right Lane podcast, um, which is Lane DeGregory is a features writer for the Tampa Bay Times. Um, and I didn't go to journalism school, so her podcast is my journalism school. Um, and something she says, and she's like, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of other people discourage this, but when sources ask me if they can bring a friend or someone to their interview, their mom, their spouse, their friend, something, like, say yes, right? Like, I mean, there are certain cases in which you don't want, like, a, you know, a university minder at the, <laughs> at the interview, but I think that... Um, the getting two people in conversation and the dynamics of that is often so um it just elicits things that you're not you're never gonna get in a traditional interview um and that's why you know that's also one of the things that's like why you go out into the field and report and you don't just report from your phone when you can because you just like circumstances conspire to create moments that you can't get from your desk um, and that's one of the really <laughs> hard things about reporting right now, um, is you're try like trying to figure out how to do that when you're not allowed to leave your desk, um, rightfully so, because it's the responsible, civically responsible thing to do, but, um, I, I, I miss going out into the fields and reporting. <laughs> um, well, I think we should, we should try to wrap this up, um, but does anyone have a kicker for the kicker? <laughs> <laughs> Sally Forth. <laughs> Sally Forth, yeah. Yes. <laughs> or you've been informed. You've been informed. <laughs> you've been informed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks so much um, to all the panelists. And uh, thanks to everyone for uh, listening in and watching. And um, Keep uh, tuning in. We have uh, events every Tuesday and Thursday this month. So thank you so much, Emily, for organizing this. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you guys. also Sorry. everyone for your good not. questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.